hi everybody and welcome to our conversation about heart rates tonight for Diabetes Australia. My name is Renza Shabilia. I work at Diabetes Australia and I'm absolutely delighted that we're talking all about hypoglycemia tonight as part of our campaign, The Lowdown. But before we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands where we are all viewing from and where we are. I'm in Wurundjeri land and I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and to any First Nations people watching us tonight. We are talking about hypoglycemia. Hypos, lows, we all have different things that we call them. It's when our blood glucose levels plummet or they go too low and what that means for those of us who are living with diabetes. This is the third year that we have run the lowdown and it's a week long campaign, a week or so, where we really highlight what it's like to live with hypoglycemia and try to raise a bit of awareness about it, about what hypoglycemia is. We wanna know why we're not talking about it anymore, why it's not really known about in the general community and how we can feel safer uh, living with diabetes when we know that we also have hypoglycemia as part of it. I am joined first up tonight by Professor Simon Heller from the UK. One of the great delights and privileges of my job is that I get to meet with people from around the world who are doing remarkable things in diabetes research. And Simon is one of those people. Simon, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us all the way from Sheffield today. Can I ask you to please introduce yourself to our audience and, and tell us, you know, Tell us about your career, in particular, the work that you've done around hypoglycemia and diabetes. Thanks, Renzo. It's a real pleasure to be here and uh, uh, to talk to so many people on, online. Uh, my name is Simon Heller. I'm a uh, clinician and a researcher, clinical researcher here in the north of England. Uh, I've been involved in diabetes research since the mid-1980s. Um, Actually, I, I came to train in Nottingham, which is just a little bit further south, about uh, 30, 40 miles from here. <clears throat> and I was planning to be a cardiologist, but uh, I had a, a great boss um, who said to me, why don't you do diabetes? It's much more interesting. And he sent me a paper, actually, about hypoglycemia published in the early 80s, when we were just beginning to discover why hypoglycemia was so important. I mean, it's not just a question of insulin, but there are things which go wrong in, in type 1 diabetes, as you know, Renza, which mm. make people with diabetes uniquely vulnerable. So not only do you take insulin, but your defenses to hypoglycemia compared to people who don't have it, uh, don't have type 1 diabetes, uh, are impaired within just three or four years of developing diabetes. Anyway, I got interested I didn't really know much about research, but he sent me this paper and I thought, yeah, this is something which is important. He was brave enough to let me have my own list of patients who uh, I talked to and made terrible mistakes. I apologize to them all, but it was a wonderful way to learn uh, and having my own list of people with diabetes to to develop a, a therapeutic relationship was, was what turned me on. And I began to live in awe of people who do so much with such imperfect tools, although they've really improved. And so my research throughout my, well, virtually a whole clinical life has been kind of devoted to try and find out why it's such a problem and importantly, what we can do to improve things. Simon, one of the reasons that I always feel so fortunate to, um, you know, to be involved in any work that we get to do together is because of the incredible respectful way you speak about people with diabetes. And I just want to say off the bat, I, it, I'm so grateful for that. And um, I always think that I learn lots from my diabetes healthcare professionals, and I'm so grateful when they recognise what they learn from people with diabetes. I think that that's when, uh, you know, then when we come together like that, it, it, it's truly uh, it works just so so well. So can we just start? I'm going to ask you a question that seems like an easy question, but I don't know that it is. What is hypoglycemia? And I'm going to explain why I'm asking you this. Simon and I are involved in a project called Hyporesolve, which we'll touch on a little bit later. At our first meeting for Hyporesolve, um, the, the group of people with diabetes, the patient advisory group, we, we sent out a tweet to the Twitter sphere and said, um, you know, tell us about your experiences with hypoglycemia. 
And we had 200 responses within about eight hours. And everybody's stories obviously were different. But we had people saying, I've never had a hypo. I've had diabetes for 40 years. I've never had a hypo. Um, But what they meant was that they never needed an ambulance. And in their minds, that's what a hypo was. But if we're trying to define a hypo, how do we define it? Let's just get on the same page about that. Okay, so the body has fantastic mechanisms as as many animals to try and keep everything within a sort of safe safe range and glucose is one of those and we should just focus on that and so people automatically keep their glucose levels between around four up to eight millimoles per liter four to eight and virtually whatever they eat or however long they don't eat for uh, how much exercise they do Uh, their glucose levels are kept automatically because of an amazing system which controls that with releasing glucose from the liver when glucose drops too low uh, and making glucose from fat and muscle, uh, which again, the liver uh, and the kidney a little bit produce. And so whatever people do who don't have diabetes, it's just not even something they think about. Yeah. But the real problem is that the brain operates on a fuel, which is, if you like, faster petrol, it's glucose. Whereas many parts of the body, people say, well, why don't you die um, if, you know, why don't your kidneys pack up if you become Mm -hmm. hypoglycemic? And the reason is that other areas of the body um, can use other products, fat, breakdown products of fat is the good example. So, it, it's the brain which is primarily affected, although we've done research recently to su- suggest that the heart itself can be affected, uh, although very rarely. Anyway, so the glucose supply to the brain is so important is that if it drops below a certain level, uh, around three millimoles per litre, the, the brain cells, which are very sophisticated, as we all know, Um, can't extract enough glucose in the blood to keep working normally. And that is why hypoglycemia is such a problem because although you can operate at much lower glucose levels and just about everybody I know with type one diabetes occasionally will test their blood when they used to test their blood and say, my goodness, my glucose is 1.5, but I feel fine. And of course they're really living on borrowed time because at any second they their brain will say, okay, I've had enough, I'm gonna shut down. And, and subtle changes can occur which people don't even notice. So, so that is really why hypoglycemia is so important. Uh, it's why uh, people who operate machinery, cars being the obvious example, yeah. have to take such an important interest. But, mm-hmm. but as you persuaded me, uh, the symptoms which occur, which partly from the brain, but partly other things which the body's doing to try and keep the glucose levels up uh, also make people pretty rotten uh, glucose which people doctors uh, don't consider sort of hypoglycemia much to worry about you know 3.8 around four whereas of course as you taught me and other people with diabetes actually you feel r- pretty rubbish when you don't even have particularly severe hypoglycemia yeah yeah absolutely and i think that that's one of the real challenges is that and, and, you know, I'm sure that people watching at home will say the same thing. Sometimes at, at 3.8, they do feel like they're very, very low, whereas they might be 2.2 and they don't feel it. Whereas at other times at 2.2, you're really focusing to make sure you're drinking your juice box or whatever. Um, so that those inconsistencies, I guess, is another reason that we get kept on our toes with diabetes. Um, I'm wondering, you know, one of the things that we've really been exploring with this year's campaign, The Lowdown, is trying to communicate the impact of hypoglycemia to people who don't live in our diabetes world. Um, And and I'm wondering how we do that and if if you've thought about how we do that. And and I guess even some of that, I guess, is from hearing from people with diabetes explain it to you and and explain, you know, what it actually really feels like and, and what we experience. How do we get it out there about the message of exactly what it is and, and, and you know, how it is a really big part for a lot of people of living with diabetes? I think it's virtually, imp- it's so difficult yeah. to try and explain 
and of course, it's not just hypoglycemia, it's the fear of hypoglycemia. Funnily yeah. enough, I was at a, a JDRF event last week and I met a broadcaster mm -hmm. uh, who's a sports broadcaster and he's he's developed type 1 diabetes when he had he was 30 years old. Right. And he very rarely becomes hypoglycemic because he now has fantastic technology, which essentially would alert him long before. But of course, he gets incredible anxiety. Uh, he's, he's a well-known broadcaster. He goes on TV uh, and is controlling things, introducing things, but he lives in fear of hypoglycemia, even yeah. though it's not a real problem for him, because what does he do if his continuous glucose monitor alerts him to the fact that he's going low. And of course, as he points out, actually, usually it goes high because he has so much adrenaline when yeah. he's presenting. But nevertheless, he's always on edge. What do I do? And, and I've heard the same thing from teachers yeah. Who, yeah. who run high as he does because it doesn't matter how much great technology he has, he's not confident enough to rely on it. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's more than just the hypoglycemia. It's the fear of hypoglycemia. And people who haven't ever witnessed a hypoglycemic event or anything just don't get it. They don't understand yeah. what this means. And uh, I don't know how you best explain it. You could show a video. Uh, yeah. Some of the drug companies show videos. They're hopeless. They don't have any <laughs> relationship to real life hypoglycemia. Yeah. The best thing we should make people come out of children's camp. That's how I learned about hyperglycemia. We had a five to seven year old group of these yep. kids. And my goodness, if they were more than 30 minutes late for, for their meals, they would stop to, they would fall over. I mean, yeah, it was yeah. the most uncanny thing. And you thought, my goodness, wow. how, do, how do parents deal with that? Well, um, yes, that's right, constantly. Um, we've got a question. This is actually a really good one. So why do some people not recognise they're having a hypo until they might pass out? And even they don't necessarily need to pass out. It could be that they've checked their glucose and they've realised I'm really, really low. So Mike, so I want to answer that question. And then I've got a part B, which is why do I feel my hypo sometimes, but other times I don't? So let's start with the first, first one. Why is it that some people don't recognise they're having a low? So the first thing to say that people with type 1 diabetes in particular are vulnerable because their best defense mechanism called glucagon, yep. which, is a, which is a chemical messenger or hormone, just like uh, insulin, uh, it's released in little cells which sit next to the uh, insulin producing cells in the pancreas. Um, and they are your automatic defense to hypoglycemia. When you first, very first get type 1 diabetes, yep. Uh, as soon as your glucose drops below 3.5, automatically this glucagon is released. And, and we know that glucagon is a treatment for hyperglycemia because we use it and it's becoming yeah, it's actually quite more, much more important. Anyway, the, the, the hormone goes to the liver and says, right, release your store of glucose. Uh, and it does. And it does it automatically. You don't have to have warnings. It just does it. Yep. And it's probably over half the most important defense that you have. But unfortunately, in type 1 diabetes, you lose that defense within four to, well, three to five years. Mm -hmm. For most people, they've lost all their beta cells. They're not making insulin. And, the, and again, without getting too technical, the insulin cells talk to the glucagon cells, and that's what switches your glucagon on. But if you lose all your insulin cells, then you can't make glucagon. So you're now operating on adrenaline as the defense, which we know also releases glucose. It also gives rise to symptoms. But what we have discovered, and, and in fact, it's one of the only useful things I've probably done in my research is to say, why do people lose their uh, warnings and suddenly become hyperglycemic? And we had this idea, actually talking to one of the professors who I work with, he said, I've always been a control for um, experiments when because we, we were doing studies. He said, the first time I felt hypoglycemia, I felt terrible. I poured sweat. I just didn't know what was going on. But after two or three, I don't feel so bad anymore. Right. And, we, and, I, and I kind of thought, well, maybe repeated hypoglycemia changes something. Yeah. So we did an experiment in, when I was working in the US and we discovered these medical students didn't have diabetes we repeated hypoglycemia in two days. On the second day, 
they made very little adrenaline, they didn't have any symptoms and they felt fine. Mm. And of course, what we discovered is that repeated episode of hypoglycemia cause your defense, your adrenaline defense to go down right. to a much lower level below the which the brain doesn't work. So that's why people lose their warnings of hypoglycemia. It's, it's a very important uh, observation in some ways, because if we can stop hypoglycemia, you can bring those warnings back again. Right. So, yep. so what goes wrong is that the first thing that happens, your brain stops working. So that's why you don't recognize your low. Uh, and also the longer you have diabetes, again, that seems to also push the adrenaline yep. defense down. So that, right. I hope it's not too technical, is it's why right. you lose yep. your warnings. Can I just say when we when we break things down like this, you know, I think we, you know, often we, um, you know, we try to simplify things. So we always think about diabetes. It's it's part of your pancreas to stop working, but it's so much more than that. And I, whenever I hear these sorts of stories, I, I always think that living with diabetes, it is a challenge. You know, it's a challenge we face every day. But trying to uh, replicate what an incredible, you know, body does. Oh. Um, and our bodies are still incredible, but we are now having to do so much more. It, honestly, I think that we we all should really just pat ourselves on the back. We're going to do that, a big, big back patting exercise, I think, at the end of today, because there's a lot that goes into it, a lot that we have to do that, that bodies without diabetes just do, and people don't have to think about it. I agree. And, and I think one of the things that I always, you know, if you're a thyroid doctor doing a hypothyroidism and you're a thyroid gland which is very important stops mm -hmm. working all you have to do is take one tablet a day yeah. and you're fixed virtually 100 percent. but yeah. they're controlling with insulin you're giving insulin in the wrong place it should be given into the liver it's given under the skin and and of course despite fantastic technology which has made such a difference you still give insulin in the wrong place and that's always going to be um, a big barrier so you're right. The tools we give people are imperfect. They are life-saving, but they don't work as well as they should. We expect people then to do that, address meals every day of their life. And when things go wrong, we then tell them off because they aren't doing as well. In fact, they tell themselves off. So it's it's uh, the odds are, are stacked against people. Again, that's why I have I've said that this is probably the most challenging condition of any of the conditions I've ever learned in terms of what the person has to do and the doctor and nurse supports them. It's so different from many conditions. Again, as a, as a doctor, it's why it makes it so interesting, but it gives you healthy respect for the people who have to do this every day. And I, as I said before, I'm so grateful. Well, it really, it is so wonderful to hear that. Why don't people necessarily talk about hypos? I mean, I know that that people feel quite judged sometimes, you know. We're, we're talking this year about there was some research done that that suggests that on average, people with type one diabetes can expect to have 138 hypos per year. And I remember reading this a few years ago before I was using the technology that I am now, and I thought, gosh, I'm an overachiever. I'm having way more than that. And of course, it's an average. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Some people will be having lots more. Somebody will be, some people will be having fewer and some people will be having right on that number. Um, but talking about it sometimes is hard, I think, because there is a fear that we're going to be judged because we've done something wrong. That's why it's happening. Um, what, what, what do you think? Why, what, what else is there in there? I, I do think it's interesting the way you say that, that if you looked at the causes of hypoglycemia in a textbook, as we used to, Mm. They were always things which, well, probably because they're written by doctors, blame the patient. In other words, too much insulin, yeah. not eating enough, leaving, a, um, you know, doing physical activity and not adjusting. So all those are implicitly blaming the person. They should say, actually, we give you, this is rubbish treatment. It doesn't work very well. What we're asking you to do is incredibly um, technical, it's way beyond the competence of most doctors and nurses. And we expect you to keep your glucose at these levels. And if we don't, if you don't, we're going to tell you off and yeah. say you should do better. And, and, and of course, it's, it's the people who also blame themselves as well. So the whole thing yeah. is stacked. And, and do you not think that inhibits people from saying, actually, 
the thing is, is worrying me. And of course, it's not severe hypos either. That again, you and, and Simon O'Neill, who works in the UK and is, is a contributor to this great project we're doing, he says it's not the bad lows. In fact, he said, when I had a really bad low, I've only had one and I was brought around. I felt really good. People were there to help me. Yeah. It's the yeah. ones which interfere with my life every day yes. and, and relieve if you lose the spontaneity, the things that other people are just doing without even thinking. They're the ones which interfere with my life. And I, and, you know, I've learned that. It's taken me probably 20, 30 years to realize that. And which is why, of course, doctors and nurses who were in hospitals who just don't know much about diabetes mm-hmm. don't get it either. And yeah. it's, you know, it's it's just the way it is, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. We've got a great question here. Why do hypos make you feel so hungry and then it's hard to stop eating? I call them the eat the kitchen hypos where I, you know, have... <laughs> Opened a cupboard door and opened the fridge and it's a free-for-all. Whatever's in there, that's what I'm eating. Is that just a bit of a, a, a response to, you know, an adrenaline response, is it? I, I don't. I think it's a, a response of the brain to going without an essential fuel. And, and the yeah. re- reason I say that, if we do a, a experiments on animals, usually, unfortunately, rodents, and you watch their response to hypoglycemia, they eat ravenously yeah. and so my hypothesis the theory is i think that the brain probably has this really important mechanism that if they're if it's short of glucose there's you're driven by a basic instinct to eat because of course um even if you don't have diabetes uh, and you're starving that is something that you have to rectify so uh, i think it's probably uh, not an adrenaline response it's a response to the specific need of the brain cells to need have glucose yeah. yep what the flip side of that is um and you know this was a moment that my husband still finds very amusing and uh you know different hypo personalities but one time i was low and i had the fridge door open and i was eating a cucumber because that's what it was that was going to bring my blood sugar up it was a cucumber obviously what else would you eat and he was very gently suggesting perhaps i maybe have some of the orange juice that's in there or eat some of the jelly beans on the counter. And, and I flew off the handle, you know, don't you tell me what to do with my diabetes. I know I'm the one living with this. I'm eating a cucumber. What's the flip side of that where we just become a bit irrational maybe and uh, don't want to eat, don't want to do something to treat it perhaps or think we're treating it, but not really. Well, I mean, again, I think these are all uh, evidence that the brain is, isn't working. Yeah. And, and we published a study way back when I got some medical students to ask the family members who recognizes hypoglycemia first. And, and we 60, 50, 60% of the time, it was somebody in the family saying, I think you're low. No, I'm not. Yes, I am. You know, yeah. would you test? Oh, I am low. I, it, it's, I mean, that must be repeated in so many families, not anymore, perhaps, or not such a, a way, because, of course, CGM has made a difference. But, of course, yeah. what CGM has now damaged us, I suppose, and in, in, in found another way for doctors and nurses to beat people over the head is to say, let's look at your trace. Mm. Oh, you're really over-treating your low hair uh, again yeah. and again, because, of course, this instinct to eat more than your regimented in the UK four or five jelly babies of course you, you just keep on eating till your course. symptoms go away uh, and and we don't have great understanding but I'm so CGM is great but it brings with it other ways uh, to beat people up with I think yeah yeah I think you're right I, I mean I love having access to, well I love using CGM I um I'm not eligible for subsidy yet, so I fund that myself here, and I'm very grateful that I'm able to do that and have the data, and it's it's a brilliant tool, and I love that I get alerted before hypos, you know, impending hypos and all sorts of things, but they're definitely, you know, the, as good as the technology is, as great as the technology is, and as you know, it is certainly far superior to, to what we had, say, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, there, there are downsides that we need to recognise. They're, they're, they're still imperfect tools. They're way better and things are getting better, but they are not perfect tools. I agree. Yep. 
Yeah. Now, Simon, I'm going to let you go because it is your work day. But before I do that, can we just quickly talk about HypoResolve? This is a European project. It's um, being run there. There's a huge number of people involved. It's a four year project. I think it's actually going to be extended. It's a little bit longer than four years because COVID, being COVID, through timelines all out. What can what can you tell us about HypoResolve and what what is it going to achieve? How's it going to help people with diabetes? Do you think? <clears throat> well, I think what we've it's enabling us to do is to find better tools to prevent hypoglycemia. I was going to say treat, but but hopefully to prevent hypoglycemia from happening. Uh, and to really understand how we can use the new tools, which is continuous glucose monitoring, hopefully insulin pumps, although I'm a little bit doubtful about whether the technology is ever going to be available to the hundreds of thousands of people with type 1 diabetes. And although I think technology is going to make a difference, I think in the end, we have to look to immunologists to either prevent type one diabetes from happening, which I now think is realistic. I still think it's 20, 30 years away, but it, but it will happen or possibly, uh, and this is perhaps even more exciting, stem cells, which can now be made, not just from uh, fetuses, but from any cells. And, and it is extraordinary how quickly th that is developing. And mm. we've already hearing that those cells are now being used. So, so, but in the meantime, I think we need to find ways to use the technology better. And I think that's what HypoResolve will do. It'll tell us more about the glucose levels, which are really important. Uh, it'll tell us also about the risks. We haven't got time to talk about the effects of hypoglycemia on the heart, but it, but it is a very rare but tragic condition that it can affect the heart uh, yeah. in human beings. And we need to understand the risks. So I think what we're doing is putting all the trials virtually that two of the insulin companies have ever done and, and finding out the bad things that happen during hypoglycemia, what levels are important and how we can use the new tools, continuous glucose monitoring pumps uh, in a better way to learn about hypoglycemia and ensure that it is, it's never gonna be nothing, but it'll be a lot less of a barrier to people uh, in the future than it has been over the last 20, 30 years. That, that's in an incessant. So we're putting all the data to powerfully looking at analysis and I hope we'll come up with uh, those kind of solutions. Yeah, thank you. And um, if anybody at home who's watching is interested, if you Google hyper-resolve, it's all one word, um, you will find information about this study. And, and there's lots of information that has been developed for people living with diabetes, um, just to get a better idea about what the project is and some of the milestones there. Simon, thank you so, so much for joining us. I'm really grateful that we've been able to, to find this time to speak with you and so grateful that, you, that, that you've been able to do that with us. Um, and uh, thank you for, for the research that you're doing and for the work you're doing. And, um, you know, I'm really excited to see where HyperResolve goes. I'm thrilled to be involved with that, but also just to see, you know, every step is a step that's making life easier for people with diabetes. Um, hypoglycemia is a tricky problem. It really is. But um, I think that um, we absolutely, uh, you know, need to keep talking about it. So thank you very, very much for joining us. Francia, it's been a pleasure. And again, I want to thank you and the other people with diabetes who, who've made such a difference to the project and really improved the research that we do. Uh, uh, thank you again. And uh, I hope the rest of the week and this program thank goes you. well. Have Wonderful. a good day. Thank you so much. Now I'm going to ask everybody else to turn their cameras back on as Simon leaves us. We've got a whole wonderful panel of people living with diabetes and we're going to talk hypoglycemia. I'm not sure if everybody has turned on their cameras, but uh, please, if you haven't yet, do turn it on and unmute yourself as well. We're talking about the lowdown. This is, as I said, the third year that we have run the lowdown. We will make sure that all the information about the campaign is in um, the discussion part of our Facebook and elsewhere on our socials. So you can click on there, have a look and see how you can get involved. 
The, the Lowdown is a brilliant campaign because primarily it's about peer support. And what I mean by that is it's an opportunity for people with diabetes to talk about our experiences, to talk about our experiences with each other. Um, and one of the things that I've really loved about this is the way that when people share using the, um, the hashtag associated with, um, with the campaign, and this year that is hypos add up, um, you know, it, it, it opens a discussion. I'd like to say thank you to Sanofi, who is our partner and who is supporting this campaign. Um, and I'm really grateful that we've got a whole look at all of these people. And I am going to ask everybody to give a really, really brief introduction of who you are. Um, and I'll, I'll call your name and then I've got lots of questions. So only because you were the first person on my screen who I am seeing, Adam, tell us about yourself. Hello. Um, I'm 32, type 1 diabetic for 20 years, um, diagnosed when I was 12. Um, I live on the Gold Coast, um, play hockey uh, at an Olympic level. I've yeah, been lucky enough to go to the Olympics. Um, okay. I work as a physiotherapist on the coast as well. Welcome. Yep. How many years did you say you've got diabetes? Uh, 20. Thank you. Next, we have Cheryl Steele. Hi, Cheryl. Well, Tell us. Hi, hi Renza. Um, I'm a 37-year veteran of living with type 1. I'm a mum of two now grown-up kids with type 1 and a grandma to a teenager with type 1. And I work as a diabetes nurse educator so hopefully can bring some of the lived experience into my uh, professional role as well. Thank you so much. Ali, you're next. Hello, welcome. Hi, I'm Ali. I'm 33. I live on the Gold Coast um, and I sell water sports toys and live water sports on weekends. Amazing. How long have you had diabetes? Um, I got diagnosed when I was 21, so about 12 years now. 12 years. Excellent. Uh, Jody, it's another person who I work with at Diabetes Australia here. So welcome, Jody. How are you? Thank you. I'm good. Thank you. I have had been living with type 1 diabetes for 35 years. Um, I am now recently the mother to a teenage boy who has just been diagnosed. I have a brother with type 1 diabetes. I have a niece with type 1 diabetes. I have lots of cousins. So yeah, pretty rife in our family. <laughs> Welcome. Hey, Pete, thanks for joining us. Tell us about yourself, please. Hi, my name is Peter Manitner. I'm uh, 63 years old and I've had diabetes for 35 years as well. Um, so I've seen all the changes. Um, I live in Hobart. Um, it's nice and dry down here. I know some of my Man, our people have been getting a bit wet, but um, a little dig because we're always the cold place. <laughs> Thanks for joining. I, I really enjoyed tonight, actually. Uh, uh, oh, we're just getting fantastic. started. Yeah, <laughs> just getting started. Don't go anywhere. Britt, hi and welcome. Hi, um, nice to meet everyone. Um, I'm 25 years old, and I've had type one for almost five years now. Um, I guess a little bit about me is I'm a provisional psychologist, and my I guess career goal would be to work in the diabetes space with a lot of um, people out there who struggle with, you know, the general day-to-day -day things with diabetes. So um, yeah, that's what I'm doing at the moment. Yep. Thank you. And Jess, hi, how are you? Hi, good. It's nice Welcome. to be here. Thank Thanks you. For joining us. Tell us about um, yourself. Yeah, so I've had diabetes for now 22 years. Yeah. Um, and I was diagnosed when I was I was five. No, that's not true. When I was <laughs> No one well, was 22. Um, 21, 22. So I've had diabetes for over half my life now. Um, and I'm a dietitian. So I decided to become a dietitian before I became uh, a person with diabetes. And, um, and yeah, so I work as a dietitian. I work as a lecturer. And, um, yeah, so it's great to be here. And right. to Thank you. Hi, Janelle. You're on mute. So we would love to say <laughs> hi. And could you introduce yourself, please? Sorry. Um, so you can hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, cool. So I'm Janelle and I was diagnosed when I was 10 years old with type 1. Um, I had it until I was 42 um, years old. So I am no longer a diabetic because I had a pancreas kidney transplant when I was 42. Um, I went blind when I was 29 from the complications. <laughs> Um, and I was an opera singer until I went blind from the complications. And as I said, I'm 
I was 32 years of type one, um, but I still live with hypos, unfortunately. So I haven't got rid of everything since I got rid of the diabetes. Thanks so much for joining us. And Jeremy, thrilled that you have been able to join us. Tell us about yourself. You've got- Hi, Renza. Story. Sorry I'm late. No, um, that's okay. You're not at all. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Jeremy. Uh, I've had type one diabetes for 12 years. I was 31 years old and working as an airline pilot when I was diagnosed. Uh, so that prompted a bit of a career change. Um, I went into medicine. I've been working as a doctor for the last few years. So that's the bulk of my professional work. Uh, but I still work as a flying instructor on the side. So I do a little bit of flying. That's me. Thank you. So with my 24 years, we have got 234 years of diabetes expertise on this screen right now. So uh, I think we can call ourselves experts. Let's start talking about hypos. I, I hope that you were all met, you all listened in and you heard the conversation that I had um, with Simon. What we're talking about in the lowdown this year is the impact of hypoglycemia. Um, so we, we have spoken a lot in previous years about what the symptoms are. We've asked people for a word to describe, you know, how what they, you know, what living with hypoglycemia is like. Um, our campaign last year was hypos happen. We were asking people for stories about where they had inconvenient hypos. This year we're talking about impact. So um, the research that I mentioned in the talk with um, Simon said that on that the average number of hypos that a person with type 1 diabetes can experience each year is about 138. So my question, and I, I won't ask everybody each question, I'll just ask a couple of you. Does that, how does that ring, does it ring true to you or do you look at that number and go, oh, maybe not, it's, it's under three a week. So I don't know, Jody. I'm going to ask you first, what do you think when you hear that? Um, look, I think my diabetes is quite stable, Yeah. but even with what I consider to be quite stable diabetes, I would think that three a week would be fairly normal. Yeah. Um, I would think yeah. it would probably be more four or five, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And what about you, Jess? What did you, I don't know if you've seen all of our campaign materials, but if you yeah. saw that, what would you think? Yeah, I would say that's a, a very much an underestimation of yeah. the number of hypos. And it depends yeah. on what's happening. You know, you have some weeks where you go up and down and up and down and you bottom out, um, you know, multiple times in one day. And I yeah. think that, you know, so it really does depend. But I would say that that's a, it's quite an underestimation of what yeah. most people with diabetes would experience. It's really interesting because I've been watching people commenting on the socials and some people have said just that and other people have said, yeah, that's about right. And others saying I don't have that many hypos. So I think it's an overestimation. And I guess it just reinforces that thing about there not being one size that fits all when it comes to diabetes. We like everything's all a bit different. Cheryl, I want to ask you a question. And I asked Simon this, but how do you think we go about explaining the impact of hypos is it about saying to people this is how many we have a week this is how much it costs us because we have to treat them well how do we explain what the impact is what do you think uh, I, I think it, it's the impact for every individual is quite different like I know I can have a day where I might have five hypos in a day and then I might have five days with no hypos mm -hmm. and you know as I was listening to Simon talk I was thinking yes I have those hypos where I'll eat anything that can't run faster than me and then other times, particularly if I wake up in the middle of the night and I think, I know I'm hypo, the CGM's going nuts, but I'm tired, I can't be bothered getting up. So I silence the alarm and I go back to sleep, which is, you know, as a diabetes educator, I'd say, oh, that's so naughty, you should never do that. But that's what I do. So yeah. because I find particularly nighttime hypos have a huge impact because you don't get a lot of sleep. You wake up the next day feeling like you've been hit by a truck and you just have no energy. I think yeah. the only times I have not gone to work because of hypoglycemia has been where I've had quite bad hypos in the night mm. and I've woken up because I don't always wake up definitely before CGM. Mm. I never woke up for yeah. my hypos. I'd wake up in the morning and I'd have my lips all cut where I mm. obviously chewed myself to bits while I was hypo yeah. um, and my blood sugar would be spiking and I'd just feel so terrible. I'd think... There's no way that I can go to work and look cheerful and happy and encourage people because I feel so shit. Yeah. I've been allowed to say shit. We can't bleep you out with our life. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that little butt. But, yeah. you know, I said, for me, that's a huge impact. And yeah. I think 
you know, I see other people really struggle to talk about their hypos because mm -hmm. they think it's something really wrong with them, that they've yeah. failed themselves by letting their blood sugars get like that. But, you know, I don't think anybody can stop having hypos altogether. Yeah. You know, we learn all the stuff about managing them and trying to minimise them, but they do happen. And I think, you know, for me, most of the time, I think, well, today's shit. Oh tomorrow's a new day I'll start again and I'll try and make it um a better day yeah. but you know for some people I'm sure for them personally the impact is is much greater so yeah. again I think your favorite saying one size does not fit all yeah absolutely Adam I'm going to bring you into this conversation because I want to ask you about how you like do you think do you explain the impact do people around you know just how much hypos might impact your life or is it something that either you don't talk about or you brush over a little bit or you just think it's too hard to try to explain maybe yeah no i think it's changed a lot i think when i uh, i mean i've had it for 20 years and i think probably going through adolescence um and into my 20s i was something i tried probably to hide a fair bit yeah. Yeah. Um, I never let, you know, my family, I never let anyone really help me with my management, to be honest, I'm not a lot. Um, and I think probably more the last, I'd say the last five years in particular, I've just become a lot more confident within myself and who I am and what I do. And um, and I think it's a good thing to share. Like even as a physiotherapist, my, all my patients know I'm type 1 diabetic. Yeah. Um, I had a low last week. I don't normally have them at work, but I, I just paused the consult for 10 minutes. I just said, I just got to go and have a you know, just something to, to eat, I'll be back. And and they know about it, so it makes my job a lot easier. Um, same thing at my at hockey as well, it's the same sort of thing. My If my coach or the players around me don't know that I've, what I'm dealing with, um, they don't understand why I might not be there for a team chat or for a half-time talk. Um, so the more, the more you get it out there, I think the easier it is to manage and the less you have to explain yourself because you already have. Yeah. 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 And I think that, you know, everybody obviously is different with how comfortable, I guess, they feel sharing their diabetes and, and you know, but I do think that for people who are comfortable, it, it does certainly help with raising that awareness and helping people understand. Janelle, I want to ask you, an international opera singer, uh, if you were standing up there on stage and about to, I don't know, sing some Wagner, uh, how did you feel, like, what was going through your head? If you were, were you worried about having hypos? What, what were you thinking then? Um, I was so worried about hypos that I always let my blood sugar run high, which is probably one of the main reasons I went blind and had kidney failure. Um, I just refused to have a hypo on stage um so like I really just purposely let my blood sugars run high and um you know when I did finally get my blood sugars under control realized that obviously you know having your blood sugars high all the time isn't the way to go um yeah I was up on stage one time and I started to go hypo and um you know I got to the point where my pianist was seeing my line because I just wasn't coming in on my entries and she's sitting along and then I just sort of, you know, mimic her and because, you know, people have noticed that, for instance, if I'm hypo, if they tell me to chew, I'll chew for, you know, one, two mouthfuls and then I'll stop and then they'll tell me to chew again. So I'll do it. So I kind of yeah. follow instructions. So, um, but yeah, it was really embarrassing. And at a certain stage, she just jumped up from the piano and said, this is ridiculous, Janelle, and led me off stage because she knew I was hypo because, um, as it turns out, her son is a type 1 diabetic as well. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Jeremy, I'm guessing that uh, as both a flying instructor and also a doctor, avoiding hypos is something that, you know, I mean, I think we all do try to avoid hypos, but talk to me about, you know, how it works in your, you know, what is the impact of, of knowing that you could be low or if you are having a low in your day-to-day -day work? Well, I mean, you've just got to stop what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and I guess it depends what, what hat I've got on. Uh, you know, when I used to work in the hospital and I was scrubbed in assisting in operations, um, you know, I never had it happen. I never had to scrub out of an operation because I went low, but um, I would give my CGM monitor to the scrub nurse and I would say to them, you know, if this beeps, you know, you have to come and tell me to scrub out because my blood sugar level is dropping below five. I'd always have it set high. Mm -hmm. um, and likewise with flying, um, if if my blood sugar level is below five millimoles, I'm not allowed to go flying. So right. um, often I'm not even hypo, but I'm just yeah. not in the right range. Yeah. Um, 
but I, you know, I like what Adam was saying before, just making sure everyone around you knows what, what is going on in your life. And you know, I spent a couple of years working in an emergency department, you know, being short sleep scrubs with a CGM on my arm with a big bright sticker. And it would be a conversation started with the patients because they'd say, you know, what's that? What's wrong with your arm? Yeah. Um, all the doctors knew I had it, all the nurses knew I had it. And on the odd occasion where I wasn't feeling right, then, you know, I just stick my hand up and say, okay, I'm yeah. just taking a five minute break. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was never a problem. Fantastic. Thank you. Ali, I wanted to ask you, so Cheryl sort of touched on something there, which was about people perhaps not wanting to talk about the fact that they have heart bows and hiding it in some ways. Why do you think that is? It is, is? And is that something perhaps that you've done or are you happy to talk about it with everybody? What Can you share, share a little bit of your experiences there? Um, I pretty much live um, obviously in the water. So I'm I have my pump and my CGM on show and everybody's always constantly asking what's that what like what is that for and I love telling everybody um everybody at work knows um that I've got diabetes um and they're fine if I need to go and eat something um but yeah it's just the awareness just got to let everybody know yeah Pete, I'm wondering, do you feel the same way or do you hide it a little bit? Because I, I you know, not everybody necessarily feels comfortable and some, and, and some people change. Sometimes they're really happy to be talking about diabetes and, and have the conversation another time. You know, I know that I sometimes, I wear my CGM on my arm and in summer I'm, you know, it, it's exposed, but there are some times that I really don't want to have that conversation. So I might wear a longer sleeve T-shirt on those days. What about you? I think uh, there was a, 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 a thing that, Diabetes Australia ran earlier in the year, or well, might have been last year, about the stigma yes. of diabetes. And I was actually yeah. a part of that conversation, mm -hmm. which brought up a lot of memories because I've had it for so long. And uh, so for me, me personally, I, I hit it, not because I was embarrassed. I was, I was a 28-year-old drummer that got diabetes and I was at the peak of my career. Yeah. And uh, being a drummer, you can't leave the stage for five minutes. <laughs> yeah. That's it. That, so I, I, like a lot of diabetes, I said, I, I ran my diabetes reasonably high. And my regime was totally different back then. So it was a mixed insulin. You know, you had to eat your 25 meals a day, whether you were hungry or not. It was, it was all about eating to the insulin, whereas now we're a lot more able to hold off meals and stuff like that. But the stigma at work was probably the hardest because I was actually working in the public face. Yeah, um, yeah. And again, you can't just get up and have your hyper and and of course you know we're talking it was interesting simon talking about the brain mm. um you don't want to admit you're having a hypo so for most of my diabetic life i was terrified of hypos mm -hmm. terrified of having a hypo by playing while working and then when we have children i wasn't just terrified about the other drivers on the road i was actually terrified about myself having a hypo while i was carting my young children around the car so that did my head in. I know there's a psychologist in here will we'll have yeah. heard this. My psychologist and myself have fantastic, epic talks about this very thing. So my fear of hypos is now cured because CGMs, the pump technology, yeah. uh, the, my diet, my community of health workers, that I, my doctors, you know, they're not, we haven't, uh, it was mentioned a little bit about the people you surround yourself with. I'm so lucky that my educators and my dietitians, yeah. um, we all know each other. It's changing a little bit. Uh, it's, I'm a bit sad that a lot of the people I know are being moved on and they seem to be moving a lot of young people in and out. And for me, that's heartbreaking because the relationship I have with my medical team, they're my lifesavers and my educators. And then they also listen to me as well. So, you know, the, the mental anguish, depression, anxiety, Mm. And you throw a bloody hypo in and, you know, it, it is devastating. I've had some, I've never gone completely unconscious, but I've had a couple of twos that have scared the bejesus out of me yeah. because uh, it's, it's like you can't get out. It's like you fall into a hypo hole and that's yes. where the, you know, you're shoveling the jelly beans, the orange juice, uh, the cucumber. They cracked me up. Cucumber didn't work. <laughs> it was like kidding. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's been a, a fantastic conversation, and and uh, we all have similar themes. The pilot guy, though, the first, I must say that Jeremy, when yeah. I was diagnosed in 1987, they said 
you will never be able to pilot a plane. And from that time on, I wanted to be a pilot. Um, and I actually found out the reason why. There was actually a plane crash here at Seven Mile Beach in Hobart. A guy had flew on all the way from uh, Sydney to Hobart, decided to turn around, took off, had a hypo, crashed his plane. And from that day on, the, the no flying thing started. So um, I, I always loved aircraft. I don't really want to be a pilot. I'm a drummer. I'm a, you know, I'm a musician. So, all right. Uh, Thanks, Pete. But I, I'd love to bring you into this, Brit, now because, um, mm. you know, hypos aren't only about the fact that we have low blood sugar, right? There is so, so much more going on here. And so much of it is the way we feel and, and how we feel in the moment, but then also how we feel afterwards what can you tell us about you know the fear your fears and concerns and and more generally the way that people feel about hypoglycemia yeah totally I think like personally I find like hypos have a hangover as well I don't know where anyone else can agree but um I find like when I have a hypo I have it for like what 15 minutes or whatever and then it's like an hour later of me like it's like a vibrating feeling and I can just still feel it and like I think with what I'm learning through my psychology career is like my nervous system is just wacky. It's like still on edge. It's like shaking still. Um, so I find when I'm like, especially when I wake up in the middle of the night um, and like you said, Cheryl, like, you know, you wake up and you're low, but then you, you have the anxiety of like, will I go low again? Do I need more food? Do I need this? And then it turns into an hour, two hours. So I find it's not even just like the low that's tough for me. Yes. Um, it's everything else in around that. At least like with high blood sugar, you can kind of carry on and you feel a bit more safe. Whereas like low blood sugar, you don't feel as safe and I think I noticed that too um you get that fear of like oh well I could crash like a Mm -hmm. a four to a two can only take like 20 minutes but like you know 15 to 12 will take like whatever how many hours (laughs) sometimes um so that's it for me yeah yeah absolutely now one of the other things that we've been talking about in the campaign is um again and we talk in averages because this is what we've seen from research and I will say this very much that everybody's obviously different but the average time to recover from a hypo is 15 minutes. Now, I'm going to go around really quickly and I'm because I do want to know what everybody thinks about this. So super quick answer with, yeah, that sounds about right or no, nah, or what you think about that. And I'm going to go to you first, Adam, because you're right there. 15 minutes to recover from a hypo? Yes, no, maybe? Uh, yeah, yes, but I've had that effect afterwards that um, you were speaking about. But yeah, yeah, 15 minutes to feel somewhat normal. Yeah. Yep. Cheryl? I would say really 15 minutes for me it's more like 20 30 minutes because you know that's particularly for those ones where I want to eat everything that can't run faster than me I don't feel back to normal for at least 30 minutes but other times yeah if it's if you catch it early maybe 10 15 minutes but it's different yeah Ali what about you yeah, I'm the same, about 15 minutes and then have that hangover effect. Oh hyper hangovers they're real Jody what about you? Yeah, no, mine takes way longer than 15 yeah. minutes. I'm, yep. I reckon I'm closer to like an hour yep. before I feel like it didn't happen. Yeah, I remember last year there was something um, on, uh, there was a something on Instagram where people were talking about this and they were saying more like 45 minutes. So, mm. yeah, absolutely, yeah. it is different. What about you, Pete? What do you, what, what do you think? Uh, 45 minutes to an hour and a half. Uh, yep. my, my hangouts seem to be quite severe and it depends what caused the hypo as well you know yes. if it was like a yeah. an insulin build up that just released and you know you're fighting that for quite some time but it's the hangover for me like i just have to close my eyes and, and reset mm-hmm. um yeah. maybe it's because i'm old i don't know no, not at all. <laughs> uh jeremy yeah like everyone else it kind of depends on the severity of the hypo um yeah but- most of the time pretty quick, but if it's been a, a, you know, a deep hypo, uh, yes, it yeah. takes time. And there's plenty of research to suggest that the average time, even once your blood sugar level is above five, the average yeah. time for your full cognitive ability to return is about 45 minutes. 45 minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Janelle, what about you? What what would have been your experience when you were having, well, now you still are having hypos. How long? <laughs> it really depends on the severity. So if they're hypos that are above two, um probably you know maybe 15 to 20 minutes but when they're yeah. under two that's when you know like I would like I've had lots of times because I've been unconscious innumerable times um where I actually can't walk for 
like the rest of the day because obviously all the glucose has gone from all my muscles. So okay. just kind of like this jelly bean person. And yep. you know, one one time when I ended up in hospital for a week, like I couldn't speak for a week. Right. Okay. Yeah. Jess, what about you? Yeah, I reckon it's similar to everybody else. It's kind of depends on how severe the hypo is. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, there's some times where you actually feel like you just, you know, you have a few jelly beans and off you go, you keep on going. Mm -hmm. um, but other times, yeah, you can be really affected by it yeah. and your brain turns to mush. Yeah. So, you know, it really does depend on, on yeah. what's happened. Yeah. Britt, thanks for, uh, for kicking us off on that. But I have a, a different question for you. I, uh, what do you think some of the biggest misunderstandings about hypoglycemia are? Oh, that's a hard one. <laughs> I, <laughs> um, I, I think personally it's, it's probably the first thing that comes to mind is how much sugar you need I guess yeah. like for me I only need like you know like a, a killer python or something like that and I'm done whereas some people will be like get me like a two liter bottle of juice or something yeah. <laughs> um I know that's a bit bit of an odd thing for me but also like um what we're talking about now it's like it's more than just the number it's that cognitive effect yes. um I know for me sometimes I have to stop the convo and be like oh sorry I'm just low I can't think straight um I feel a bit drunk right now <laughs> like, yeah. like it's a little bit like wet like um hazy in my brain so I find that's a bit hard for people to understand yeah. um, but also on the other end I think some people take it quite seriously if they're like oh oh my gosh like you're low and you're okay do you need anything and then they go like quite dramatic I guess <laughs> yeah yeah actually I'm gonna ask you Jody. does that annoy you when people around you want to make a bigger deal about it than you feel it needs you can deal with this you don't need a cast of thousands what where does that is that something that you've experienced um, look, I was a high school teacher for 25 years ah. and I used to open my class at the beginning of every year saying, just need to let you all know that I have diabetes and if I behave like I'm drunk, I'm not, <laughs> I'm just low. So I've had lots of kids, you know, teenage kids yeah. like helping me out and, and they've yeah. been really great. But I think maybe the thing that is annoying is that you can solve a hypo on your own if it's you're not too low. Mm -hmm. But I think when you're really low and you need help, um, yep. the the impact that has on your family yep. is so monumental. Like, uh, you know, sometimes I think hypos have a way bigger effect on your partner and your parents and your children than it does on you. Like, yeah. you know, yep. um, and I think you know, like, like what you were talking about earlier, Renza, like being upset with your husband. Like I've got so many stories over 35 yeah. years where, you know, I've gotten really upset with people trying to help me. So I don't want the cast of thousands, but, yes. you know, I know I need it, but I don't like the impact it has on them yeah. at all. Yeah. Like I think that's the biggest problem for yeah. me. Absolutely. Yeah. And what, what do you think some of those misunderstandings are about hypo, whether it's your own hypos or hypoglycemia in general? What do you think that, that people just really don't, don't know what it's generally about, really? Um, oh, I don't know. There's a few things that I get. And this maybe gets a bit off topic, but um, right. a lot of people want to ask me if I'm that, am I the diabetic that needs sugar or, or needs um, or doesn't need sugar? <laughs> well, okay. I, 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 I get that a lot, actually, yep. from patients of mine. And so... There's a misunderstanding there, and I don't know if hypo and hyper are a bit similar, you know, in how they're said and what they are, but I find that, yeah, I get that question a lot. I don't know if anyone else is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, look, I, I blame Grey's Anatomy because I'm pretty sure there was an episode where they wanted to give somebody who was hypoinsulin. Like, oh, no, no. How bad is your diabetes? Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, like, she's not working very well. Yeah, that's not going well. Um, but yeah, I mean that's probably just some yeah some of the common misunderstandings. Um, Absolutely. But if, I haven't had a, a doctor, a, a, a doctor friend of mine. Um, I was at their house last week, and um, that this is not their area. It's not what they do for, yes. for their yes. work. Um, hope they're not listening. Um, <laughs> I won't say their name. They know who they are. But <laughs> I was low at their house, and I and I basically just said, oh, I can, you know, have you got something? I'm just having a little high blood here. And, um, she came back with a, like a zero sugar protein bar. Oh, good. Useful. Uh, and I said, oh, well, thanks. Uh, but like, do you have honey or something else as well that I can have with it? <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, I don't know. Like, you know, I, I thought that was really interesting when I left there thinking, um, yeah, yeah maybe, there isn't a lot, maybe there isn't a lot of awareness um, out there. About yes. What actually is, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I I don't know. I think I'm sort of a bit in two minds about this. Is that sometimes I feel like people think they know lots and they really want to be on top of everything, and other times they want to give you insulin when you're low. What What about you, Cheryl? What do you think some of the biggest misunderstandings about hypoglycemia are? I think amongst colleagues, um, yeah. you know, like if your diabetes is well controlled and you know what you're doing, you're not going to have any hypos. Oh, I think I, I get wish. very annoyed with fellow yeah. health professionals who think it's all a matter of just you give the right insulin, you make adjustments for staff, you eat the right food and, you know, why do you have hypos? Yeah. Um, so that's very, very frustrating. Um and, you know, challenging, I think, to, to move some people's mindset because yeah. they just don't understand how complex it is. I think hypo and awareness, again, is something that, that's very scary for everybody who lives with diabetes because, like, I'm lucky, apart from having the CGM that goes nuts, I still, through the day, get really good awareness despite mm -hmm. 37 years of diabetes at night without the CGM to wake me up, I, I wouldn't know. Okay. Um, and that's quite scary. And I think... I have to say on a personal level, one of the things I hate most or most misunderstood is I hate not being in control. So when I'm hypo, I lose that feeling of being in control. So I can get quite resentful if people want to help me because I think I should be able to do this myself. Um, and I think a lot of us feel that way that, you know, we should be able to help ourselves and, mm. you know, and I try and analyse. If I have a hypo, what did I do? that precipitated that and can I not do it next time and you know there really are no answers because diabetes is not that simple yeah it's really complex isn't it it's yeah really complex. exactly unless you lead a very boring life I guess and yeah. never do anything um <laughs> even then I still think it's probably complex probably. Ali, Ali we're solving the big problems of the world here I want to ask you how do you think that we can get the broader community to better understand what hypoglycemia is um it's just talk tell everybody awareness, post it all, all over Instagram, um, Facebook, people need to know. And that's the thing, like a lot of my friends, they, um, they don't understand um, the difference between hypo and hyper as well. Like I'll have a low and they'll be like, oh, here's a Pepsi Max. And yeah, it's like, really, you're my friend. I've, you've been around me. I've had that many lows, but it's just, you know, the more you tell people, teach them, the more information you feed them, um, the more they see it, it's like anything. You talk about a car that you've never seen and then all of a sudden you talk about it and you see that car everywhere. Yep, so yep, yep. if people are learning more and it's over and over again, then they'll kind of get it. Yeah. Jess, is that something that you find useful as a person living with diabetes when you see other people talking about their experiences, talking about hypos? Does that make you feel reassured and or is it a useful tool to point to people who don't have diabetes to say hey can you just read this to try and get a better understanding what do you think about that well, look I think it's so fantastic when people can share their experiences yeah. of having a hypo because I think it really can be different for different people um, and I you know I quite often I mean I'm working with a lot of dietitians they will actually ask me about you know well what is it that what does it feel like how, how can you explain that to me um, and it really is I mean when you're asked to explain what a hypo is and how it feels and how it affects you and what the impacts are um, you know it can be quite hard to articulate yeah. and to, yeah. to talk about and I just quite often say well it's like your brain and your body are just completely dis disconnected <laughs> and yeah. you know so it, I think it really is hard to explain to people but it is about having those around you um, witness it and for yes. them to uh, help articulate that and say oh you kind of act my kids say to me mum remember that time you went crazy and I'm like oh yeah I can't do <laughs> and they'll tell that to other people there was a time yeah. when mum went just really crazy and I thought I was the funniest person in the world um, and the kids thought that that was a little bit odd um, but you know I think it does it affects it, it affects you in such different ways so you know and yeah. Everybody experiences it differently, I think. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I totally, totally agree with you there. Um, Jeremy, I want to ask you a question uh, about this too. Like what, what are those frustrations that you might have? I love the fact that you've been quite open with your colleagues about it, but are there frustrations that you have? Are there frustrations with people in the medical field who don't necessarily know about hypos? Yeah, I mean, there's, everyone's got fantastic stories about 
crossing paths with a medical practitioner who just seems to know nothing about type 1 diabetes. Um, and I, you know, people love bringing those stories up when they find out that I'm a doctor. Yeah. Um, but to be honest, I, I haven't encountered too much of it in my personal you know, yeah. journey through my medical career. But the frustrations that I get about hypos are in the broader community, people assuming that I can't do things mm. because I have type 1 diabetes yes. and because I have hypos. Yeah. And um, trying to explain to them that, well, yes, you know, hypos are a part of type 1 diabetes, but if I, if I manage myself well, I can manage those so that the risk of having them is, you know, no greater than the risk of someone else, you know, needing to take a break from work for some reason. Sure. Um, and that, in fact, having type 1 diabetes and hypoglycemic episodes doesn't mean it doesn't limit me from doing things yeah that, that i think is probably the most common conversation i have with people yeah thank you we're going to wrap up in a minute i'm going to ask everybody one last question but i will because i'm feeling a bit generous give you a moment to think about it and that is you know a closing remark you know what you wish people knew about hypos or what you think we need to do to make to, to raise awareness, I guess. So I'm going to go around. But before I do that, I just want to say thank you to everybody for joining at the panel, to Adam, Cheryl, Ali, Jody, um, Pete, Britt, uh, Janelle, Jeremy, and Jess. A huge thank you as well to Simon for Hella for joining us earlier on. Thank you so much to Sanofi, who has been our supporter for this campaign for this year and for the previous two years as well. If you go to the lowdown.org, um, um, uh, we will make sure we share all that information, uh, .org.au, I think it is. Um, you will be able to see not only this year's campaign, but previous years as well, including the community involvement. I think that's been one of the most amazing things about this is just how people with diabetes, not just in Australia, but around the world have, have really jumped on the low down bandwagon to share their stories about hypoglycemia, to talk about what those frustrations are. But this year, what we're really trying to do is to highlight what those impacts are, what the time is, what the emotional impacts are, what the financial costs are, um, how having hypos impact our lives, how it can make us late for work, it can make us, you know, miss social engagements, all sorts of these sorts of things that unfortunately it is part of life with diabetes for so, so many of us. But uh, parting words, how to fix this really big problem, I don't know. Let's start with you, Cheryl. Let's throw um, you in the deep. Um, <laughs> I, wish, I wish there was a fix. You know, I think all we can do is be open and honest and make sure people understand that having hypos is a normal part of living with diabetes. For the most part, um, we can manage them and get on with our life, but we do need sometimes just to take some time out to recover properly so mm -hmm. that our brain does catch up with our body and we make sure we're safe with whatever we're doing. Yep. And it's absolutely okay to say, I need to stop for a moment because I'm having a hypo. That doesn't mean you failed. It doesn't mean that you're, you're not good at diabetes. It doesn't mean any of those sorts of things. It means that you're listening to your body and you're doing what needs to happen. Adam, absolutely. your parting words, please. Yeah, I just think um, just having that understanding that I, I guess each, each one of us individually will have different um, responses when we're low and, and, um, and yeah, it, it varies even within yourself. So yeah. Just having a bit of an understanding, yeah, of that, and um, and I mean, I'm all for communicating and talking about, it. and I think the more we can do that, yeah, the more like anything, the the more people will become aware of it. So um, we don't want to be low either, you know. I just it's just part, just a yeah. part of what we deal with. Um, but generally, we're yeah, we're not. So it's just those little those little parts in the day that all week that we just need. Yeah. Sure. Thank you, Janelle. What would you like to say? Uh, I, you know, I'd like people to, you know, stop blaming us. Like, you know, I get blamed a lot for my hypos, even though I'm saying I, it, I had nothing to do with it. Like I've got the best control I can possibly get. And it just happens sometimes. And that people just understand that, you know, you can't always control it, that it's just going to go low sometimes because you've done a bit more exercise or have got a bit more stress in your life or whatever that, you know, people just uh, more accepting and also that you know what you're doing to get yourself out of it that they don't have to fuss and carry on over you thank you i think that's such all great advice especially a bit about not blaming people with diabetes ali what would you like to say how would you like to wrap this up yeah so i guess just um people just not um 
yeah thinking that because we're going low that we've done it to ourselves that the fact that there's so many different factors as to why we go low like you know being outside in the sun for too long or the heat mm-hmm. or stress or there's all so many different factors other than just food or insulin that we go low so I guess yeah just talking to everyone letting everyone know that's the reasons why um, yeah. and the next time then they yeah don't make a big deal about it yeah there are 42 reasons according to Adam Brown who's a diabetes advocate from the UK from the US, 42 reasons uh, or 42 different factors that affect our glucose levels. So there is a lot going on there. Jody, what would you like to say to wrap us up here? Um, I think I'd like people to know that it's not a clinical solution. Like you can't just have five jelly beans and you're immediately okay. Yeah. I think I, you know, I'm quite good at communicating to people that I have type one diabetes and I will have hypos and I need to have jelly beans, but it's more than that. You know, yeah. I think I would like people to leave knowing that it takes a while and you can't think straight for a while afterwards and it has a bigger impact than and it's not fixed with just a quick few jelly beans I'm not right immediately yeah I think that message is not out there at all yeah and so much of diabetes it's not necessarily just a simple equation it's really yeah it's always so much more yeah Pete how would you like to finish up well first I'd like to say Rinda thank you so much for having me here and to my fellow my fellow type ones it's been fantastic hearing all the bits and pieces you you asked what I think could change this yes Uh, it is someone like you Oh. Uh, you, you, we need a face, we need a voice, and not just from diabetics talking, but the, pe- the people that represent us have a voice. And you're a fantastic presenter and being a diabetic, getting our message out. And then we also need to bring in everyone else, so the educators, the people on the diabetes board. And then once you do that, once someone actually talks to them, then people will start listening, doing everything like... My, my pet hate with the whole diabetic life is that you see a newspaper or a news report, you know, new uh, therapy discovered to cure diabetes hasn't been tested yet, wait for five years. And then at the end, I say, and if you have type one diabetes, you'll have kidney failure, heart failure. So we go from positive to negative, just like that, and yeah. nothing in between. So this is the platform to me as the starting point. Thank um, you. That's, that's you, you, you're, you're, the, you're our. Oh, no, nice. I'm not. I've got, I'm looking at all these amazing faces and this is what we need. We need many voices. We need lots of people. And um, that's why I'm so grateful that you've all been here to share your stories, but we've still got a couple to go. Jeremy, I'm going to ask you, what would you like to say to wrap this up? Oh, I think much the same as everyone else. Just keep talking, yeah. talk, talk to people around you, you know, people you work yeah. with, your friends, um, and yeah. just explain what, what causes hypos. And if, you know, if you're having a hypo and you're treating it, don't go and hide in the corner or take yourself off. Sit yeah. there and involve people. And, yeah. and that will get rid of the stigma. It will get rid of people's fear that you're going to drop dead um, when they see that you can you know, adequately treat your own hypo. Because we're talking about people having you know, an average of three a week. Yeah. There aren't, you know, people don't go to hospital three times a week because of hypos. Oh, of the vast majority of the time, yeah. we're all perfectly capable of managing our hypos. Yeah. Um, so I think reducing that level of fear. But uh, again, making sure people understand what to do if you are significantly unwell yeah absolutely but yeah talking talking to people thank you thanks so much Britt what would you like to say yeah um I agree with everyone's obviously um just like on a different note I think for the people who have type one watching um I think it's been I'd love for those people to know that it's okay to be selfish in that moment when you're low especially if you have it so often each week like you obviously it's great that we all want to start the discussion like but maybe when you're actually low like accept that it's okay to be selfish and you can deal with it however you need to deal with it um I think that's really important so I'd love for people to take that home yeah that's I think that's such brilliant brilliant advice thank you and Jess you're going to bring it home for us now well I I I tell you what it's quite hard to add to what everyone (laughs) 
said, but I do think that there's a, a space to be kind to ourselves yeah. um, and to recognise the fact that we're not perfect and that we have um, so much to give and we have so much to share and that being able to actually do that in a way that's informative for other people and to say, you know, look, you know, I am having a hypo, this is what I'm experiencing, you know, I'm going to take five and I'll be back in a minute. But yeah. quite, quite often I'll sit there until I can't speak and then I'll actually go, oh, I've got to go and get some more. Now's the time, yeah. That's right. Because I don't want to miss out. I don't want to miss out. I know. Um, but, yeah, yeah. I, think, I think that we do have to be kind to ourselves and support those around us that... Um, that might not understand it and, and bring them up to speed so but thank you for tonight it's been amazing oh, thank you to all of you now this conversation may be over but the lowdown certainly isn't uh everybody watching at home thank you to everyone who's been watching at home there's been massive conversations and chats happening uh in the comment section on facebook so thank you to everybody who has contributed there and shared their story and um actually there is an opportunity for you to win a 100 um gift card a gift card um by sharing your story and using the hashtag hypos add up you can also send us anything if you have got your social set to private where you're sharing them so send them to diabetes australia and um, we want to continue this conversation not only in our diabetes circles but beyond our diabetes circles as well so if you share it on your own socials where you have people who don't have diabetes who are not from the diabetes world world you're helping to raise awareness of what hypoglycemia is and we thank you very very much for that please keep an eye on the lowdown we're not done yet we still do have a couple of days and there is still a lot of discussion to be had um, this is such an important campaign we have this time dedicated to talking to this very real short-term complication of diabetes so thank you to everybody who has so far shared their story thank you to everybody who has been doing that on social media and who will continue to do that on social media and um, we hope that this has been useful to people this will remain on our Facebook page it will also be on our other socials as well so you can share it with people who may have missed it but who perhaps need a little bit of a refresher or an understanding about what living with hypoglycemia is all about um, please do that share it with your workmates with um, with your you know friends from sporting teams whatever it might be to get the word out about what hypoglycemia is as we try to continue to address this issue thank you so much to everybody and we might now end the broadcast so thank you bye bye <laughs>